This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. Hello and welcome. My name is Dean Beck and I will be your host for this, the first hour of World AIDS Day Worldwide, emanating from the studios of Australia's only gay and lesbian radio station, Melbourne's very own Joy 94.9. Melbourne is the traditional home of the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong peoples of the Great Kulin Nation, and it is their homeland today that we are broadcasting from. We pay our respects to their elders and indeed to all Aboriginal elders and Aboriginal peoples who might be listening today. We also pay our respects to those whose lives have been lost to AIDS, and we acknowledge the courage and the resilience of all of those who live with HIV today. To our international audience watching via the World AIDS Day Worldwide.org webcast, thank you for joining us. Over the next 24 hours, we will be exploring six different themes and we will delve into each one of those themes four times. Our website, World AIDS Day Worldwide.org, has more information about each of these themes and you can visit the site over the coming months as you prepare your visit here to Melbourne for July next year for the AIDS 2014 uh, uh, International Conference. It's the largest medical and scientific research conference ever to be staged here in Australia. Today, we encourage you to be a part of this very special broadcast. It's a global conversation and we want your contribution to it. You can do that by using the Twitter hashtag JoyWAD or by sending us an email on air at joy.org.au. Our World AIDS Day Worldwide broadcast has an extraordinary lineup of guests for you today. We have heads of global organisations, some of the world's biggest names in science, and international community leaders all united in their commitment to ensure an end to HIV and AIDS. Our first guest is an author and co author of over 270 original publications and of more than 120 articles and book reviews. She has been invited as a speaker to nearly 300 international meetings and conferences and has been pivotal in promoting the integration between HIV and the AIDS response and ensuring action in countries that have limited resources. Together with her team of eminent scientists, she discovered the virus that was causing AIDS, and that was over 30 years ago. Awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2008, it is my great pleasure to welcome the International Chair of AIDS 2014 Conference, Professor Francoise Barres Sanusi. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. Our second guest is connected to HIV. Uh, he, well, he be began his connection to HIV in 1991 whilst being a secondary school teacher in the United Kingdom where he joined the activist group ACT UP in Manchester. Upon returning to his native Canada in 1993, he worked for five years in the community-based sector with the Canadian AIDS Treatment Information Exchange as an educator and coordinator of treatment advocacy. With a background in political science, international relations, education and counselling, he's now the Associate Director and Chief of HIV and AIDS section in the Program Division for UNICEF. Mr. Craig McClure, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. And finally, joining me here in the studio is the Executive Officer of Living Positive Victoria. Having lived with HIV for 15 years and working in the sector at all levels uh, in regards to government and community response, Brent Allen is also from Canada and he is well placed as co-chair of the AIDS 2014 Community Program Committee. Thank you for joining us here in the studio. A pleasure to be here. Professor Francois Barres Sanusi, I'll start with you. Tell me what it was like when you first discovered what it was that was killing men throughout uh, America and Europe. Uh, it has been a, a, a terrible period, a dramatic period for, uh, of course, first uh, the people uh, infected by this virus, but uh, for all the communities uh, as professional scientists uh, because uh, we had no solution at that time. Uh, we discovered that the virus that's true and we developed very rapidly a test for diagnosis, but we had nothing to propose to them for treating them, which is not the case today. 
it must have been a, 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 a sort of a challenge for you to have found that that one thing and yet all of the procedure then had to start. You then had to work on some way of countering this virus and the terrible toll that it was taking. And in the meantime, it just continued to spread. Exactly. And uh, certainly uh, we, we started to realise, uh, uh, let's say in 1984, 1985, the magnitude of uh, the epidemic. And at the same time, we knew that uh, as a scientist, as a researcher, uh, we needed some time to develop uh, a solution. Uh, and of course, uh, this was really a, a terrible challenge, a terrible period for all of us. Craig, uh, Craig McClure, if I could come to you. These days, fast forward to now, um, we see nearly half of all new infections are uh, uh, the youth of today. Uh, they're under 25 years of age. And this is a whole new uh, stage or new phase for the epidemic. Yes, it is. I think, though, it's first, uh, first of all, it's important to, to note the incredible progress that has been made, particularly in the last 10 years. Um, if we talk about young children being in, infected due to vertical transmission from their mothers, either during pregnancy or delivery or through breastfeeding, we're really on a path to eliminating those infections. Just in three years alone, we've gone uh, from close to half a million infections to less than a quarter of a million. And we have a target and goal to eliminate mother-to-child transmission by the end of 2015. Just in 10 years, over a million new infections in children have been averted. But as you point out, uh, the, the, the key challenge right now is to make that kind of progress in the second decade of childhood, or what we call adolescence. Um, we invest so much, we've done so well in that first decade of childhood in terms of testing and treating all pregnant women, preventing those new infections in children. But we have, if we want an AIDS-free generation, that means ensuring that kids are born HIV-free, but they also remain HIV-free from birth right through to adolescence and into adulthood and that those kids who are living with HIV have access to the treatment, care and support they need to grow up to be healthy and productive adults and contribute to the, to the new emerging challenges that are facing the world in this century. Francoise, the, the idea that uh, the, we could have a universal response to HIV and AIDS uh, was forgotten long ago. Each country has a very different uh, connection to how uh, it plays out within their own culture and within their own society. How does a scientist work towards countering that? Yeah, a scientist uh, is uh, part of the society like everyone, and it's the role of scientists to be the advocates um, to uh, increase the access to uh, tools that science delivers. Uh, and it is the case for HIV. I mean, Craig just mentioned what uh, happened during the last 10 years in adolescence, but we know also because of the tools that we delivered, in particular the antiretroviral treatment, we know that with this treatment, we have evidences today uh, that we can decrease the number of infections, we can decrease the number of deaths, this is re really the, 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 the information that we are getting is that, for example, we have decreased uh, by more than 30% the number of new infections since 2001. Uh, and this is due to the improvement of access to antiretroviral treatment to all in the world. It's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. Today we have... Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, about 10 million of people on antiretroviral treatment, but we know that we need more than 28 per million of people to be on treatment. So as a scientist, I, it's not acceptable myself to find out that there are tools, the tools are efficient, and not everyone in the world has access to it. We, we have to move and to accelerate this. Brent Allen, we have access to treatment here in Australia and we have 
considered ourselves, I guess, very fortunate that uh, the level of infections have been fairly stable uh, for at least the last decade. Um, but we're seeing an increase in new infections. Uh, in a why is it that uh, we are seeing that in a time where we have so much knowledge and so much uh, resources in a, in a rich country like our own? Uh, I think that there's a lot of complexity around why we're seeing increasing infection rates. And we also have to understand where those infection rates are occurring to understand that complexity. Some of it is certainly residing within the men who have sex with men population or gay men. Um, and I think that there is a sense of fatigue. Um, I certainly wouldn't use the word complacency, but certainly a sense of fatigue. I think that there are also new technologies. I think people are trying to understand how to have a satisfying sex life, for example, um, and integrate new technologies. Um, things around uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, for example. Um, things like uh, alternating their sexual behaviors and, or modifying them in certain ways to reduce risks. Early on in the epidemic, I don't think anyone thought that condoms were going to be used forever for the rest of our lives. And I think, you know, and I applaud um, the, the new innovations that are coming out around giving people options. And I think instead of saying, you know, it's condoms 100% all the time, I think we have to start moving, certainly in countries like Australia, to understanding and embracing complexity. Francois, the, the idea that, uh, that we have all of these things at, at, at our uh, disposal here in this rich country like ours, and mm -hmm. then we, we look at figures like you've quoted already uh, internationally, they blow us out of the water um, from a statistical level. Um, and those countries are struggling to get the medications uh, and the resources that they need to adequately respond. Um, what level of uh, challenge is presented by the uh, current uh, international uh, refugee uh, situation, which is right throughout Northern Africa? What, how is that impacting HIV? I mean, those, uh, the challenge are tremendous still today i mean because it's a, it's a question of implementation it's a question of uh, funding and uh, we have to raise this question because this is a year of the replenishment of the global fund uh, for access to, to to treatment to all uh, but it's not only a question of funding it's a question of organization uh, in, in the countries it's a question of political willingness in in, in the different country. We have different patterns in, in, in the world. Uh, and of course, uh, we have to take into consideration uh, all these distinct patterns of uh, uh, infection, access to, 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 to treatment, to care prevention and treatment in, in the different countries, whatever uh, the, the, the population are and wh wherever they are. Um, it's a question of life. So for me, it's not a question of uh, population. It's not a question of where they are. Uh, it's our responsibility for of all of us uh, to make them to have access uh, to care prevention and treatment. Craig McClure, uh, the idea of putting uh, young people on uh, preventative medicine, uh, is that something that is a possibility in the near future uh, with this emerging trend of, of people uh, so young uh, getting HIV? Well, you know, the antiretroviral drugs are incredibly powerful tools in the epidemic. If people living with HIV have access to early treatment, the chances of transmitting HIV to another person are virtually eliminated. And we have learned through research in the last few years that if uh, HIV negative people uh, who are regularly at risk take antiretroviral medications as preventative medicine, they can also be prevented from acquiring HIV. That's one tool. It will be a difficult tool to implement, maybe easier to implement in high income countries. But we have to remember that we also have some other incredible tools. We know, we have always known that condoms are an excellent means of preventing HIV transmission. 
We know that working directly with communities, particularly marginalized communities like the gay, bisexual, transgender community, like com uh, communities of women and men involved in sex work or prostitution, we know that working directly with people who are dependent on drugs through the community organizations works in terms of getting messages across in people's own language that they can understand and make decisions about changing their behavior. We know that medical male circumcision works to prevent transmission from women to men, and particularly in Africa, where transmission rates are so high and the epidemic is generalized across the population, then circumcising men, medical male circumcision, reduces the risk of female to male transmission by 60%. And of course, if boys and men don't have HIV, heterosexual boys and men don't have HIV, then it's very difficult to transmit to women. So we have a number of highly effective tools. But how much, of that, is, one of, them. How much of that is cultural rather than uh, just these uh, interventions, if you like? Well, you know, things are very cultural. And one thing we've learned over 30 years is there's no one-size-fits-all approach for every community in every country. Each country has to know its epidemic, target its investments and its approaches to the communities most affected. Um, and if we do that, then we have this opportunity, really an un unparalleled opportunity to end the epidemic in this in this century. We've lived with a terrible scourge of AIDS for 30 years. We have the tools, and if we now have the leadership to make, to make those tools, to implement those tools, the political leadership and the courage, particularly to work with young people and face the challenges that they face in growing up physically, emotionally, psychologically, the kind of uh, experimentation that young people are doing with relationships, sometimes with alcohol and drugs, if we face up to the realities of young people's lives and use the tools that we have, then we can truly contain this epidemic once and for all. Brent Allen, it sounds like uh, an incredible juggling act uh, with different balls thrown in the air, depending on what country you're living in. Um, what is it that we need to do here, I guess, uh, politically, uh, to make a difference on the ground here in this country? Well, I think that, you know, in terms of what both Craig and Francois are saying, you know, understanding your epidemic in your country is vital. That's the first step. You need to know where you're working and who you're working with. Um, secondly, I think it is about what Australia has demonstrated quite effectively over since the beginning of the epidemic, which is about a partnership. You know, if you're going to start um, predicating your responses on an adversarial approach, um, it's not going to get as, as, as far as working in partnership. So the, the partnership between the researchers, uh, the community, and our leadership, our political leadership, is vital to making sure that it's an effective and comprehensive response. For example, you know, there was early on in the epidemic an understanding that, you know, injection drug use was a high-risk activity. Um, so the leadership in Australia faced up to people's fears about injection drug users and, you know, the little yellow bins you see all over the place for disposals are ubiquitous in Australia. They are everywhere. You would be hard-pressed to find any public toilet where there isn't, for example, a, a, an injection a disposal site in it. That's not the case around the world. And I think because of that early intervention, that leadership there, the fact that the community advocated and explained the rationale behind it means we have an epidemic amongst injection drug users that is basically non-existent. Francois Perez-Sanusi, can I get from you uh, your perspective on Australia only adopting rapid testing in the last uh, less than 12 months? Um, something that internationally has been available for so long. Uh, are we taking our eye off the ball here? I think it's important to implement uh, rapid testing. It's Im important as well to implement the self-testing. Uh, I'm glad that, for example, in my country, in France, uh, the uh, national advisor uh, of, uh, of the government decided to uh, accept uh, the, the access to self-testing, of course, with a, a, an environment uh, in, in order to help people uh, if uh, their test is positive. So um, we have to move really uh, fast in, in access to testing uh, everywhere in, in the world. 
Uh, I was a few weeks ago in Argentina, for example. They told me in Argentina that uh, uh, early uh, rapid testing, uh, they have terrible difficulty to implement because not only of uh, the doctors, but also the people that are making the test are not yet ready to use this test. And it's a question of uh, information, education, even in the laboratory that are making the test. And as uh, Craig said before, we have to involve more community uh, for testing. Is it a case of an education uh, process within the community regarding testing? You can't, for example, roll out home testing uh, before rapid testing. You would have to do one after the other and slowly implement the two. And if that is the case, we here in Australia are going to be even further behind the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> right. Yep. OK, fine. <laughs> yep. uh, that's pretty can, clear. Yes, Craig, please. Can I, can I just pick up on the, on the testing question? Um, and just to follow up on Francoise's comments, if we talk about young people, especially kids under the age of 18, only less than less than one in five, really just over 10% of them know what their HIV status is. Normalizing HIV testing, making it available in all sorts of different formats, whether it's um, testing people through health services using laboratories, whether it's using rapid tests, whether it's self-testing, community-based approaches to testing. Knowing your HIV status is a really important way of then thinking about prevention options, or if you are living with HIV, um, treatment options. The fact of the matter is that in many, many, many countries throughout the world, um, it remains that kids under 18 have to have the consent of their parents in order to be tested. And while, you know, it's very important that children talk to their families about the issues they're facing in life, health issues and otherwise, but we know that it's not always possible. So we've been uh, calling, WHO and UNICEF issued new guidance on adolescent testing and treatment just this week. And one of the recommendations is to call on all governments to review their policies and their laws around consent to testing, to try to make it easier for young people to have access to HIV testing. How, what sort of a role does uh, the education system play in this? And by that I mean if parents have trouble conversing with their children regarding sexual activity and, and uh, those sorts of messages, is it the role of the education system to intervene on that level? The yeah, education... Yeah, sorry, Francoise, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I said, certainly. <laughs> I mean, it's not only the parents. I mean, for me, everything starts, you know, from uh, from the education system and, and, and the school itself, uh, where probably during, uh, in many countries, I don't know in Australia, but I know in Europe, um, the, the, the education system is not optimized these days regarding education on on. on sexually transmitted disease in general, etc. Uh, Brent, uh, would oh, you like to comment on the Australian system? <laughs> I would absolutely agree. You know, I think that there's been, as I was saying, you know, I can certainly exalt the Australian response, but in terms of education, the same thing goes here. You know, um, we don't have a comprehensive um, sexual health um, and well-being curriculum across the country. It's varied in various states. Some uh, fantastic teachers take special initiatives in their classrooms to ensure the health and well-being of their students. And some of them do it under um, great, great duress. You know, many teachers have to face angry parents or angry school committees. That's ridiculous. You know, we're, we're looking after the health and well-being, the lives of our young people. I think comprehensive, um, easy to understand, plain English or plain language um, education is the education that works, that makes a difference. We would love you to join the conversation by getting in contact with us. You can use the Twitter hashtag JoyWAD or you can email us on air at joy.org.au. Our guests are Professor Francois Spare Sanusi, who 30 years ago discovered HIV. We're speaking also with Craig McClure from UNICEF and in the studio with me is Brent Allen from Living Positive Victoria. When we come back, we'll explore what is ahead next July for AIDS 2014. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. 
In Melbourne, Australia, it's 6.30am. In London, it's 7.30pm. And in San Francisco, it's 11.30am yesterday. I'm Dean Beck, and with me is Professor Francoise Beret Sanusi. She is in France. Also, we're speaking with Craig McClure from UNICEF and Brent Allen from Living Positive Victoria. Uh, Francoise, could I start by asking you uh, the conference is coming to Melbourne next July, but That's right. e the Asia Pacific region, how is that, say, different from uh, the uh, Sub Saharan African uh, issue with HIV? Uh, as you know, the, the, of course, uh, the prevalence and incidence of infection in Asia Pacific is not the same as in Africa. And the, the, the key affected population also uh, is, are not exactly uh, the same. In Asian countries, in particular in Eastern uh, Southeast Asia, for example, uh, it's mostly in IV uh, DUs uh, who, who are strongly affected uh, by uh, HIV infection. Similar patterns as uh, in uh, Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia. Um, so, and we know that uh, we have to, to, to share uh, about experiences uh, within the region, Asia Pacific. Uh, but also, we have to share about differences uh, in the response to uh, HIV infection in the different countries. So, uh, for me, the, the, the International AIDS Conference in Melbourne will be a wonderful opportunity, uh, really, um, to strengthen the effort uh, across the region, but also across other uh, parts of the world, uh, because it's, uh, it, it's an international conference. Of course, we will have a focus on the regional aspect, but uh, we need also to share experiences with others in other parts of, in other parts of the world. Craig McClure, what uh, will UNICEF be doing at AIDS 2014? And how is it that uh, our region uh, and I guess it's it's youth. Your 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 focus uh, will be highlighted at the conference. Right. Well, j just to build on on Francoise's comments, um, uh, in in for for UNICEF, the key the key outcome we want to see from the conference is that young people are more mobilised. Um, that young people in Australia are engaged in the conference, but that they're thinking globally and acting locally. So they're thinking about young people's risk of HIV in different contexts, whether it's in Australia with, with young gay men, young kids involved in drug use and living on the streets, or whether it's young girls in, in, in Africa who are at much greater risk than young boys to infection due to all sorts of reasons, but in particular, um, gender-based violence, uh, the lack of access to girls to school. So, you know, this is an issue for girls, for boys, for marginalized communities. Um, our involvement is uh, going to be supporting the youth scholarships, again, to get young people engaged, youth scholarships from around the world, but also working with our office in Sydney around um, bringing young Australians to the conference, what we call UNICEF Youth Ambassadors. Um, we also want to highlight this issue of of adolescence and HIV. You know, one scary figure that we, we published yesterday in our stock-taking report on children and AIDS is that across all age groups in the last seven years since 2005, the number of deaths due to AIDS has dropped by 30%. But in kids, 11 to 19-year-olds, the deaths due to AIDS have increased by 50%. So for us, this is going to be a key key message at the conference, and then also to to continue the 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 efforts and to for people to be aware of what is going on around the world in terms of making sure that all pregnant women have an HIV test as part of their basic antenatal care, and if they're positive, they're treated to keep themselves healthy, to prevent transmission to their babies, and to pre prevent transmission to their partners. 
So this is a huge opportunity uh, for UNICEF, for the whole HIV community coming to Melbourne to look at the, the epidemic in Australia, in the region, and across the world, celebrate our achievements, but really face up to the, to the difficult challenges we have if we really want to end the epidemic. Uh, Brent Allen, both uh, Francoise and Craig suggested that uh, this connection to community on a local level here and, uh, and that engagement can have a real difference. You're a co-chair of, uh, I guess, the community connection uh, with the conference and Melbourne and Australia. How are you going to facilitate that, uh, that connection and how are you going to engage the community at large? I think it's a real challenge, but I don't think it's as much of a challenge as it would be in, for example, other countries. You know, we have an engaged population. We have, a, we have a, a, an active, um, socially mobile population in terms of the gay population who's very engaged and wants to see, you know, fantastic things from this conference. But I think when you're looking at the conference in and of itself, some of the things that the community sector globally wants to see is the real activation of people living with HIV. You know, we're proud to say that you know, the work we've been doing so far in terms of designing content for the conference has really focused on, well, where's the HIV positive person on that panel? Where's the person living with HIV from sub-Saharan Africa who can start talking about what's going on down there? You know, where's the person from uh, a sex worker background who's prepared to come out on stage and say, I'm a sex worker living with HIV? Those are the voices we want to hear. And in terms of content, I think the thing uh, underneath the conference we really want to see is a growing body of evidence that supports the activation of people living with HIV that is able to say from a policy research point of view, the more you involve the patient, the more you involve the community, the better the outcomes you're going to get for the society at large. I have a question that's come in from Andrew in Sydney, listening online through World AIDS Day Worldwide.org, and it's for you, Craig. Uh, you stated just before that uh, uh, the community engagement is very important, and we're fairly good at that with the LGBTI community. How do you get the straight community to engage with this issue? Ah, well, that's that's that's. Uh, it depends on where you are, of course. I, I guess the question is around engaging the straight community in Australia. Um, from my perspective at UNICEF, uh, not to say that there aren't lesbian and gay parents, of course, because there are, and a growing number of them, but most parents continue to be heterosexual couples. Getting parents involved in issues around HIV, getting them to care about how their young people, uh, their young people's sexual lives, growing up, whether they're straight, whether they're gay, um, this I think is 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 key. If parents become interested in issues of HIV and AIDS among their children, then I think um, uh, there'll be a, you know, a, a much greater commitment to addressing it a, a across all populations. Um, you know, but really, it's not really a question of gay or straight. I mean, I think the, the, the awareness that we want to build through the conference in Australia is, first of all, that this is an epidemic that's been with us for 30 years through hard work, through the efforts of researchers, people living with HIV, people programming, doctors, nurses, everyone working on HIV in the last 30 years, we have got to the point where we've made huge progress. We also know where we haven't made that progress and what we need to do next. So I think it's really about engaging all people um, in this fight to end the epidemic. We shouldn't lose sight that uh, AIDS 2014 uh, at its core is a uh, science and, and medical conference. Uh, Professor Francois Barret Sanusi, what sort of developments can we expect uh, from the scientific field? And you know that there's the big C word. Um, can I get uh, your thoughts on whether there will be some uh, big announcements in Melbourne? Difficult to say in advance uh, because uh, the, the abstract will be submitted and uh, we don't know yet what will become the content of uh, uh, the abstract. However, uh, of course, we are expecting uh, important new data, uh, both on uh, novel uh, approaches for treating uh, the, the people living with HIV, uh, 
uh, novel uh, uh, approaches to improve uh, testing, prevention, uh, uh, and so on. But we will have also uh, what uh, the patients themselves are expecting everywhere in the world. Uh, we will have a symposium before the conference on HIV cure. Um, you know that uh, there is a strong uh, effort now worldwide in order to accelerate research uh, towards an HIV cure. Uh, when we are speaking about towards an HIV cure, it says that we are mostly thinking about having a treatment that pe people will be able to stop, to have a sustainable remission of treatment. And there are some proof of concept today that uh, this might be possible. So uh, certainly uh, during the symposium before the conference and during the conference, it will be several uh, presentations around uh, research on uh, towards an HIV cure. When we think, it, when we think of uh, uh, science and medicine and we hear... Uh, that, that we want to accelerate that. Um, part of me says, does that just mean more money is needed or is it more than that? It's not money, it's of course important, but it's not only money. Uh, you know, uh, and the early years of HIV really are, are, are proven how much we can be faster if we work better together. Uh, so It's a fairly competitive field though, surely... Uh, one research area wants to outdo the other. Yeah, but uh, competition at low dose or, uh, is good. Uh, <laughs> it's a question of dose, let's say. <laughs> like um, So you can compete, but you can also collaborate. And if you collaborate at multidisciplinary level, uh, and if everyone is bringing his expertise and for research on HIV cure, like for research on, on, on vaccine, we really need to work at a, a multidisciplinary level uh, because we don't we need several expertise. It's not only to be a virologist, to be a scientist. Uh, it's just to be a specialist in immunology, in genetics, in virology. We need to put all this expertise all together from different countries in the world. And indeed, we're, we are glad because uh, in Australia, you have, a, you have a leader on research on, on HIV cure, as you know. We certainly do. And uh, Professor Sharon Lewin will be joining us, uh, I think, at 9 o'clock uh, for our broadcast on worldaidsdateworldwide.org. We have a question for you here, Brent, uh, from Matt here in Melbourne. He asks, uh, with HIV becoming treatable, and manageable as it is today, how do we make sure that the youth still consider it a serious concern? Matt believes that not enough of his friends are sex smart and that scares him. And perhaps I'll then go to you, Craig. I, I think Matt's comments are, are well placed. I, d I agree. I don't think um, I like the term sex smart. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure everyone is as sex smart as they should be. And, and that's of multiple ages. I think some of the education starts um, in school complemented by, as Craig was saying, with parents. But then further to that, I really believe if you want the education to stick, if you want people to start adopting behaviors that are, that are normative, um, you've got to get into the peer groups. You've got to start working with young people in their social circu circles, in their um, groups and activities, and make um, safe sexual behavior something that's normative. How do you make that not boring? Well, I'm not sure sex is ever really that boring, <laughs> is it, Dean? Um, but I think um, I think it's about saying where people are, uh, and part of, of of making it uh, of making the knowledge accessible and understanding is also addressing some of the fears people have about sex. You know, do I look good when I'm having sex or not? <laughs> yeah. and, and I think people think, oh, that's really trivial. It's not trivial. Let's talk about the whole sexual. And being. there's those things about confidence and body image Absolutely. and all of that that play out in that space. Uh, Craig McClure. We've had the message safe sex that was then made safer sex and now we have uh, Matt's comment that uh, was sex smart, which I kind of like. Mm. Um, are we mixing up the message and confusing people along the way? Uh, no, I don't think we are. I think that one thing that we've realised 
uh, in recent years, um, most people working in the epidemic, is that we really need to take HIV out of isolation. It's not about HIV alone. It's, a, it's about human rights. It's about gender equality. It's about education. It's about child protection. And it's about sexual and reproductive health. HIV, um, we have very specific tools to prevent and treat HIV, but we have to also address the HIV epidemic by looking at all the challenges, the social um, challenges in the world that we live and addressing those challenges which really increase people's vulnerability to HIV. So, for example, if I take the example of young girls in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and their incredibly high risk of HIV infection, part of it is that they're not in schools. We have new evidence in the last couple of years that if you give cash transfers to young girls to attend school, that their HIV rates actually go down because they're participating in school rather than out in the world trying uh, to, make, to make their way as young girls, often getting involved in transactional sex with older men, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So while we have to apply the very specific tools we have to prevent and treat HIV, we have to look at the problem across the breadth of issues that are facing young people and adults today. Uh, Professor Francois Perez-Sanusi, there's been um, billions of dollars uh, invested in HIV around the world. Uh, in some cases, it's making uh, great inroads. Um, and the, the change that seems to be occurring throughout sub-Saharan Africa is quite mighty. But in other regions, uh, it just seems to be money down the drain. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I just think that, uh, uh, you know, if, if you look in, in Asia, for example, a lot of money has been given, for example, in Cambodia, and uh, Cambodia is among the countries uh, which is one of the best examples where more than 80% of people that need to be on treatment are on treatment. So, um, I, I mean, it's, it's a question of money and political willingness. Uh, so, for me, it's not, still, it's not enough money. We, and we have to really uh, uh, make the government to, uh, to understand that they have to continue their commitments. And not only for HIV AIDS, because, you know, what has been done for HIV AIDS, and we are really starting to see that uh, in Africa, but uh, uh, we need more study in other countries as well. Uh, it's not only improving the life of people with HIV, it's also improving uh, the life of people in those countries, more for global health. And certainly today we have to make some efforts to make a link uh, between HIV AIDS and other uh, health issues. For Craig. research, but also uh, globally for response to uh, the disease uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, Craig McClure, the engagement with um, uh, major corporations from a phil philanthropic point of view uh, has really boosted the response to HIV internationally. We have the Global Fund uh, uh, meeting in uh, the US in a couple of days. Australia has yet to commit to uh, its contribution to the Global Fund. Tell us how the Global Fund has really made a difference as far as you're concerned. Well, first of all, I just want to also say that there has been not been a penny spent on HIV and AIDS that has been money down the drain. The value Thank you for, for correcting money, me. <laughs> the value for, I mean, this is not to say that we need to be effective, we need to be efficient, we need to focus those resources on where it matters. But if you look at where we were in 1996, when treatment first became available, it cost t over $10,000 per year per patient, and nobody thought we could treat anyone in any country in Africa or any poor country in the world. Treatment now in poor countries costs just over $100 per person per year. And that's been through the incredible work of activists, of scientists, of everyone working the epidemic to drive the prices of drugs down. And now if we apply those lessons to other areas of healthcare. So for example, there are new drugs just coming on the market for hepatitis C, a huge problem in the world. Again, coming onto the market at 
hugely expensive prices. But the work that's been done around getting prices of HIV drugs down is now being applied to hepatitis C, so the so same mistakes aren't being made. So that's just to say that I think the investments that the world has made in HIV have really borne fruit over the last 10 years, both in terms of the percentage of people who have access to treatment, from going from about zero in poor countries to over 60% have access to treatment now throughout the world. Phenomenal success. Um, now, just on, on to your, 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 your question around the private sector. Um, the private sector has made big contributions to the HIV response, but if we look at um, the Global Fund, for example, um, the bulk of the resources invested in the Global Fund are from, uh, from, from bilateral governments, from rich country donors. And uh, yes, we are. I'm heading to Washington tomorrow for the Global Fund replenishment, and uh, we anxiously await and hope for a uh, significant contribution from Australia and the other countries who have yet to commit. Um, but uh, some countries have already committed. Some committed more than, than they have in the past, including uh, the UK, including France, including the US. So um, the contributions of governments are important. Private sector is important. And, and um, in particular, I think large corporations, huge corporations who have um, health services for their own employees, those kinds of direct contributions to the health of their own employees, both in terms of prevention and treatment, uh, have really made a difference. Um, the involvement of, of uh, uh, conglomeration of companies, for example, working uh, globally on advocacy uh, to stop laws in countries that prevent entry of people living with HIV. So there are still, I think, close to 40 countries in the world that don't allow people living with HIV uh, to, to enter those countries, either to visit or to work or to live. And uh, private sector has um, launched a, a large advocacy campaign in recent years around reversing those laws. So yes, indeed, private sector contributions are important. Um, Personally, I think the private sector could contribute much more to the fight uh, against HIV uh, and use the examples of, of those companies that have made a difference. Brent Allen, in wrapping up, I want uh, you to send a worldwide invitation to those listening around the globe at worldaidsdayworldwide.org, uh, an invitation to come to Melbourne for AIDS 2014. I think AIDS 2014 is going to be unique. I really, really do. I think what you're going to see at AIDS 2014 is not just the activation of science and political leaders working together, the major uh, conglomerations, business conglomerations, as well as our major um, uh, leaders in terms of things like UNICEF and, and the UN and the WHO, but you're going to see community coming together, I think, in a new way. I think uh, the community is getting smarter. It's getting savvy. It's being able to understand how we make an influence and not just bang the drum and, and, and be activists, but be agitators in a way that is working with people um, to make a difference. Professor Francois Barre Sanusi and to you, Craig McClure from UNICEF, thank you both for joining us via Skype today. It's uh, been great to have you as part of this broadcast. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dean. Thank you all. And Brent Allen, uh, good luck with your contribution to AIDS 2014 next July and uh, I'm sure we will have you on this station for quite some time as we lead up to it. Um, you've got some big things uh, ahead today. Tell us what's going on. So uh, today being World AIDS Day here in Australia already, um, there's going to be a fantastic uh, presentation from Bayong Sang Suu Kyi um, this afternoon at Government House. Um, there's uh, a play reading at uh, called Death of Kings tonight and a big party tonight at Circuit Bar um, where it's Viva the Red and everyone's going to be there in red. It's going to be amazing. We will be bringing you all of the highlights from Government House here in Melbourne, Australia at 6 p.m. Australian Daylight Savings, savings Time here on World AIDS Day worldwide.org and on Joy 94.9 in Melbourne. Coming up next is Shannon Powell. She'll be talking about what's holding us back and exploring the history of where we've come from. I'm Dean Beck. I'll be back with you at 6 p.m. this evening. Bye for now.